technically still good morning, everyone, but good afternoon as well. Uh, I just want to thank you all for being here and really having this opportunity. Um, this, uh, I want to welcome you to the plaque unveiling ceremony in memory of GCC professor David Hurst, who passed away August 18th of 2022. Professor Hurst began teaching organic chemistry and physical sciences at GCC in 1964. He also taught courses in chemistry, physical science, astronomy, and humanities during his tenure. He was a professor at Glendale Community College for more than 40 years. That is a lifetime of service to this community, leaving a trail of impact on his students and undoubtedly on his colleagues as well as we look around this platform today. Professor Hurst was recognized as a Distinguished Faculty Award recipient in 1992. He and his physical science department were responsible for developing the astronomy program, which was the impetus for the construction of our planetarium. And uh, I will say, just on a personal note, the planetarium is something that draws countless students, thousands and thousands of students a year, to really understand and be interested in science. This vision for the future and creativity in the ways we can reach students is a hallmark here at GCC, something that a lot of our faculty share. But Professor Hurst is an exemplar that we can all continue to aspire to be. It is important that we take the time to celebrate those who have succeeded in their calling, and Professor Hurst certainly did. It is through this reverence that we remind students, employees, and the community that we care about the contributions of those who have paved the way for GCC's future. This plaque is a physical representation of our respect and of our gratitude for a lifetime of service. And I hope it will serve as a reminder for the next generation of faculty and staff to think bold and to work to make their vision a reality. I just want to thank everybody personally for being here because I, I do think this is something that we need to do more of. There are countless people on this campus who have dedicated their lives to the service of students and to make sure that this community has a successful college and I think many of them are among us today, and I want to say thank you to them as well. And I think that this is an honor that everybody shares in really celebrating the great work of faculty leadership on this campus. And with that, I want to introduce our board president, Trustee Ransford, who will do the honor of unveiling the plaque. And if everybody can make their way towards the entrance of the planetarium, we will get to see and hear what this plaque uh, dedicates in terms of our honor to Thanks again, everybody, for, for coming uh, coming today. And before we get started, I'd just like to remind everybody that we are sitting in this, this beautiful state-of-the-art facility because of the two Daves, Dave Hurst and Dave Davenport, who's here with us today. We're here today to remember David Hurst. Dave's contributions to the college and to our, our students were enormous, to say the least. That much was clear from Dr. Horner's remarks. And Dave will be remembered for those contributions and by all of those whose lives he touched. But Dave was more than the sum of those contributions. He was a man of immeasurable goodwill and kindness. And that's how I remember Dave. When I came to GCC more than 25 years ago now, Dave was already a senior member of the faculty, and he was liked and respected by all. I, having spent the last several years just trying to get a job, was somewhat intimidated by the senior faculty, but not by Dave. 
He was one of the first people at GCC who made me feel at home. His love for teaching and for his students and for the college taught me a lot about the importance of what we do here and about the importance of doing it well. He is, I believe, for all of us, an example of the kind of educator and the kind of person we should strive to be. His loss leaves us poorer as a college and as a community, but we are certainly richer for what he gave to all of us and for the legacy that he leaves behind. At this point, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Cressel. Thank you. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, my name is Jenny and I am the present director of the GCC Planetarium. Um, I have Dave to thank for retiring because it is his retirement that allowed the job to be vacant for me to um, be hired into. So I never got the opportunity to work with Dave. I didn't meet him for the first few months that I was on campus, but his legacy was huge because on a daily basis, I would meet other faculty and staff who look at me and say, oh, are you the new Dave? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, <laughs> hi. And, and that was really intimidating. And his shoes were huge to fill. Um, Dave Davenport and Dave Hurst were the push behind this amazing facility. And I remember coming in here for the first time and literally my jaw just dropped and worked in a few planetariums prior to coming to GCC, but I looked at this place and I'm like, and I still feel that way. I still feel that because of their work and bringing this facility to campus that I have the best job on campus. Mm -hmm. I have an amazing workplace and amazing colleagues. Um, many of you have been on campus, know Dave well. Um, I got to know him much better when he gave me everything that had been left in his office that he didn't want to take home. And that was stacks of <laughs> curriculum. And I'm like, mm, great. But over the years I've gone through it and I'm like, oh, I can use it. Oh, that's really well done. It's like, I love how this is set up. And everything he did is still timely, it's still appropriate, it's student-centered, and it's wonderful to have. Um, I would also ask you that when you do leave the planetarium, just in our hallway, have a look on the right-hand side, because there's a big picture of the zodiacal constellations from the Middle East, and that was something that um, he gave me from his office, which every time I walk past, I'm like, from Dave's office. So Dave's office and Dave's legacy is, is kind of still loom, looming large in my life. And I was always inspired him to, or inspired by him to kind of think bigger, think beyond just the teaching. And recently, um, with the help of the college, we have built a new observatory up at the observing pad and we'll be getting a research grade telescope that will be leading um, student research, independent student research, original research here on campus. So the planetarium was um, an excellent beginning and I hopefully will take his legacy of teaching and um, excellence in teaching to the next level with our research program. So with that, I am going to pass this on to our next individual who will speak, which is Dr. Sheldon Hurst. Thank you. There you go. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a microphone here? And you think oh, that you would like it? Hey, you know, this, this is amazing for me. Just a moment. Um, 1964, we, um, we did a little journey 
from southern, from uh, Chicago to make our way out to this very strange place that uh, David had been to because he met, uh, had an interview with Dr. Veltman, I believe, uh, who was there, uh, who was here. And uh, on our journey, somehow I got a chance to be with him that whole 2,000 miles. And uh, we went and we stopped and we went and we stopped and we camped out and we did all kinds of things together in the process of moving to this strange place. Well, you think that you got then a man who uh, had some sort of education, which he did, but uh, you did not know that he really loved astronomy. You thought, as a college, you thought he would teach uh, chemistry, as I recall. And uh, lo and behold, he did, right, Dave? Uh, <laughs> chemistry was it. But somehow there was this interest that I knew he had from high school. He took me out. I was a little kid in southern Ohio, and he said uh, when he was, uh, got his car and he got able to drive, he says, uh, Sheldon, come on with me. I want to show you something. And uh, out we went from southern Ohio, a city named Hamilton, and off we went into the farmland. And uh, there, there, somehow he said, uh, this is a good place. We'll just park right here. Well, we parked in a farm country, and I don't know if, that, if any of you live in farm country in Ohio, but it's rare to have somebody pull off on the side of the road in southern Ohio and just sort of douse the lights. You get notice, <laughs> and we were noticed by the, the people who lived in the farmhouse just a little ways away. So, okay, Dave gets out and he says, now I want you to look up. But meanwhile, I looked at that farmhouse and the light in the farmhouse was casting behind this guy who came out and he got bigger and bigger because, you know, the shadow. Man, I said, Dave, this guy, what are you going to tell this guy? You going to tell him we're interested in the stars? Oh, yeah. You know, so there we were. I learned something about my brother that day. He was undaunted by the neighbors, by a farmer, by anybody who was going to show the stars to his little brother. So he, you got him to teach chemistry, but you also got him to be the human being inspired by the, the things that are deepest within his heart. And I think personally that that's really the gift that came with me those thousands of miles yet here in Glendale. And it was that gift that if he was a good teacher, that's why. Now his mother was my mother. Where did she learn to be mother? Where did she, on a farm in Illinois. And where did she learn to be a, a teacher at Joliet Community College, which was the first community college in America, 1901. And I know that one of the sister schools was here in, in California called Glendale. Now, before David left for this place and with me, I knew him to be doing all kinds of research about the value of community college teaching and community college purpose. So there we were, and I, all the way I get to learn more about uh, community college teaching. It's not research, except in how do you teach better than what you taught and were taught. And man, he knew how to do that. Now, did he learn it from anybody? Uh, maybe mom, because <laughs> she was a damn good teacher. And not only could she teach my brother, she taught me. And not only did Dave teach a whole bunch of people here, but he taught me. 
And so I say, what a gift you have had in my brother. <laughs> so uh, I walked into his room uh, at home and I pulled off this little book that uh, of poems by E. E. Cummings, and I'm going to close just to tell you one of his poems. One of the poems that I know he knew, and uh, we're involved in the remembering and forgetting, right? We have to forget them in some ways, and you take over, and you, you, you can't quite forget them, but you do, and you teach, and you discover the things maybe he didn't know, and uh, what a gift that is for you in that process. Here, here's the poem. It's great. It's, you, you know, you, you come in, have, you, have you ever heard of him? <laughs> well, in time of daffodils who know the goal of living is to grow, forgetting why, remember how. In time of lilacs who proclaim the aim of waking is to dream, remember so forgetting seem. In time of roses who amaze are now and here with paradise, remember it, forgetting if, remember yes. In time of all sweet things beyond whatever mind may comprehend, remember seek, forgetting find. And in a mystery to be when time from time shall set us free. Forgetting me, remember me. So, you got a lot of remembering to do, uh, the stars' names, but also the uh, whole experience of what it is to teach and learn and discover from the great beyond. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for doing this in memory of our brother. And I'd, I'd like to introduce now Dan Moore, who's a close friend of, of Dave's and also a student. Yes, yes. Dave. <clears throat> Just a few thoughts about Dave. It was 42 years ago this last September I met Dave. I just moved out here from Chicago and enrolled in Glendale Community College. The Serenity 101, Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. with Mr. Hurst. It was how I met Dave, as I would later call him in life. Our friendship began with his first class when the lights turned, turned off, a screen was lowered, and he presented 35 millimeter slides that had, he had taken of different constellations, planets, and stellar objects. His presentation, his enthusiasm, and his measured pace allowed the entire class to enjoy the discovery of the universe through his eyes. During this class, he called, he talked about a picture he had taken with some students two years earlier, where they had discovered a faint astronomical object that was not on any star charts. Mr. Hurst told the class with all humility <coughs> that he wrote to the International Astronomical Union, which is responsible for cataloging and naming conventions of all stellar objects. He received a letter back from the IAU that said, Mr. Hurst, thank you for your inquiry. The object that you have brought to our attention does have a name, and it was discovered two weeks prior to your letter. He was on the brink of a remarkable discovery, a humble teacher from GCC, who is so passionate about the stars. Observational 102, we read about the great astronomers, Ptolemy, Copernicus, Kepler, and others. One of his favorites was Galileo Galilei's The Starry Messenger. There was a kinship between Dave and that starry messenger who peered through the telescope, discovery, excitement, and the ability to communicate that to others. Dave brought these historical ghosts from the past and made them live again. I now consider him my history teacher too. Our small class would spend many nights up in Angelus Crest 
Joshua Tree, Mount Wilson, and the Stony Ridge Observatory peering through a 30-inch Newtonian Cassie grain telescope. We would be busy setting up several telescopes and attaching cameras to these hyper-long lenses, charting stars and plotting the orbits of the Galilean satellites of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto were also a few of our tasks. Our observations, we would listen to Handel's Water Suite or Bach's Brandenburg Concerto. Blasting through car speakers, we were outdoors under the night skies, listening to great music and dancing with ghosts from the past. Advanced Astronomy 103, a very challenging class that requires some deeper thinking and fear mathematics. <laughs> At this point, I had confidence that I would do well just because Dave was teaching the class. I, won't <clears throat> I will never forget the road trips to UC San Diego, Mount Palomar, Caltech, and UCLA, attending lectures by some of the world's great astronomers. During my last year, at GCC, I took two chemistry classes from Dave as well. I shifted from the concepts and views of the universe to a world of subatomic particles. Understand, I was a C student in high school chemistry who had very little interest in science. When Dave pushed the cart into the classroom loaded with graded papers, notes, slides, transparencies, and visual demonstrations, ready to get across concepts that might be difficult to explain with words alone, I knew I was in good hands. There were many like me who appreciated Mr. Hurst and were enthusiastic about his classes. We were the students who sat up front asking the questions and enjoying his presentations. On one occasion after class and before a major exam, I was talking to Dave about how to balance a chemical equation. A student from the back approached Dave and asked him if he would take all points for incorrect spelling. He chuckled and said to the entire class, for this college course, you are required to know how to spell. I laughed at the absurdity of the question and asked him if we had to know how to spell the abbreviations for the elements on the periodic table. We both chuckled. Patient, kind, steadfast, he allowed for pregnant pauses in his class for concepts and ideas to be realized by his students. I had many of those aha moments. With a simple nodding of the head as my light bulb went off, I would look at Dave and his eyes would just widen just slightly, acknowledging my understanding. He was a humble craftsman and, a, and dedicated to his profession. When I would visit him during office hours, I would often run into his roommate, Dave Davenport. He, was, he always spoke highly of his colleague. In a small sized room, Mr. Davenport would have papers piled ceiling high, while Mr. Hurst would be the model of minimalism. <laughs> they were great friends, a balanced equation. One of my favorite poems was written by William Butler Yeats called Gratitude to the Unknown Instructors. What they undertook to do, they brought to pass. All things hang like a drop of dew upon a blade of grass. I sent this poem to Mr. Hurst and told him, he's the first one that comes to mind when I, when I read it. And he replied, I think any teacher would appreciate this idea and the great message Yates uses. He also added with a sense of humor, it's brief. I might even be able to memorize it. <laughs> Mr. Hurst was the best instructor I ever had. I was blessed by the chance and realized as I got older how rare it is to have someone who undertook life's work with such passion. Dave, I won't forget. Oh, um, there was one class I took from Mr. Hurst that I didn't finish. A humanities class which he co-taught with Joe Van Dam. It was only a semester long, but this class continued for the next 40 years. After I graduated from GCC, I kept in touch with Mr. Hurst. It was at this point he had me call him Dave. This took some getting used to. I met his wife, Netta Elizabeth, who was just six months old. 
Dave and I would often talk on the phone and get together for his get together for his 50th birthday. I took Dave out to lunch and introduced him to my fiance Susan, looking to him for his tacit approval. He had high praises. <laughs> Dave took an interest in our two kids, Carly and John, opening this planetarium for John's Cub Scout troop, and he and Netta being present for John's Eagle Scout ceremony at JPL. Dave tutored John when he was taking high school chemistry. He would, he would explain concepts to John while I would wait in the other room and listen, enjoying, a lesson, enjoying the lesson he had prepared for my son. I would write him a check at the end of the tutoring session, but he never cashed any of them. I asked him about this and he just waved it off and said, it's just mad money. Recently, John and I enjoyed a lesson with Dave in Owens Valley, learning about the geology of the Bishop Tuff eruption. When my daughter Carly was entering college back east, he emailed me and said, Dan, be prepared to have a daughter who has another growth spurt blossoms and becomes a peer. Experience he had gotten having raised Elizabeth. He saw John for the last time at his college graduation party just this last summer. Over our many meals together, we talked about a variety of subjects, art, science, literature, history. We would discuss several books that we had re read by David McCullough or talk about US Civil War history, which was of particular interest for both of us. We attended a U.S. Civil War conference at the Huntington Gardens to listen and talk with the historians. Gary Gallagher was moderator and Dave's friend, Ron White, was one of the speakers. We spent a few months reading and discussing Dante's Inferno, very heady stuff. After one of our lunches, he sent me a note and said, Dan, I enjoyed the time at lunch, both the food and the conversation. Both of them left me with some nice leftovers. Sometimes months would pass as Dave and Netta spent time at their home in the Mammoth community, enjoying the beauty and the geology of the Eastern Sierra. Dave once emailed me and said, we'll be in Mammoth for a couple of weeks, enjoying the winter scenery and the cryogenic lifestyle. He even emailed me a picture on his way up to Mammoth that showed his car speedometer, which read 186,295 miles. Hi, Dan, he said. Here's what my odometer looked like when I took a break, somewhere between Lone Pine and Bishop. After looking up the speed of light to more significant figures, that's just 13 miles greater than the distance light travels in a vacuum in one second. <laughs> Truly humbling, Dave. <laughs> of course, Dave and Netta travel frequently. We just got back from a visit to Sweden, land of the Vikings and Aquavit. After a fine time of being entertained royally by Netta's relatives, we spent a week on our own driving around and exploring southern Sweden. Let's get together for lunch soon, a lot to catch up on. I often wondered who the other friends and family were in Dave and Netta's life. We knew a few, but not many. They had many circles, but few intersected with ours. That changed when Susan and I were invited to Dave's and that is 50th wedding anniversary at the Tamil Shanter Inn. This is where I discovered that Dave's younger brother, Sheldon, both share a similar sense of humor. It must be genetic. Ray, Stewart, and I will never forget John Day, Oregon on August August 21st, 2017, to view the great American solar eclipse with Dave. He texted me at one point and said, a lot of crazy people will be here at this event. I'm glad we're the same ones. <laughs> and then a few hours later, another text, Dan, some of the articles I've been reading make me believe we might be attending the Burning Man event. <laughs> he wasn't wrong. Many shared our enthusiasm as the moon aligned with the sun and earth. One person who didn't speak English and was with his family from Mexico City was an astronomer. 
when he realized Dave was also an astronomer, they both gave up a chair and embraced each other like fellow astronomers do, I guess. This was the Woodstock of astronomical events. <laughs> After the event was over, we talked about getting together again for the next great North American solar eclipse, which would be April 8, 2024, in the Adirondacks in northern New York. Sadly, there's been a change of plans. I last saw Dave a few days before his passing. We met at our usual spot, Pineburger, at our usual table for breakfast. I did notice that he had lost some weight since we last got together, and he mentioned that he was not in the best state of health. The doctor was looking into it. We talked about family and the recent passing of our favorite author, David McCullough. As we stood up to leave, Dave took his time held on to the table to get his balance. He was moving a little slower as we both walked back to our cars and said goodbye. We talked the next day and made plans for all four of us to have dinner the following Sunday. <laughs> Netta, Elizabeth, Drew, Rich, and Aaron, I know this is especially tough for you. What a wonderful family you are. Dave was a loving husband and dad and was part of a close-knit family. I find it difficult, especially now, of expressing my love for this great teacher, who I was very fortunate to call friend. For many months, I found myself shuffling around the house, just remembering and thinking of our great experiences. I walk outside at night and look up into the heavens and remember the past with fondness. I cry. When my mom passed away, Dave sent me a note that said, Dan, we watch our parents get old, but it's always too soon when they leave us. I feel the same way about Dave's passing, too soon. A friend who is a Catholic priest told me, nothing can make up for the absence of someone we love. It would be wrong to try to find a substitute as if it were even possible. We simply hold on to our loss, comforted by our memories, and see it through. There is a sacred space for Dave Hurst in all our hearts. And if by chance you are outdoors under the nighttime sky, cast your eyes to the heavens and give him a smile. An audible thanks for his friendship his passions, and his love for all of us. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to his friend and colleague, Peter Stathis. didn't know uh, Dave as well as many of you here, um, but in February of 1984, when I began my full-time teaching here, uh, which seems like yesterday, <laughs> um, we were in the same division before a kind of mitosis or meiosis or one of those things occurred and we split up in two divisions. Mathematics and Physical Science Division. Um, but I got to know Dave very well because he, um, he became a regular member of this research uh, group that went to Las Vegas every year. <laughs> <laughs> and had a, a variety of misadventures. If you uh, were at Dave's memorial, you heard Ray Liana describe circuitous route they took. Was that to Vegas, Ray? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> That's the other part of yesterday. I don't remember. Um, even if this is a bit of a digression, 
I, uh, what I'm about to say, I feel that uh, I can say it because uh, Dave liked to hear anything new. It was you know, great inquisitiveness of his. Um, you know, it was insatiable. So uh, I read about this ancient tradition that when a person dies, his closest friends would gather and sit around the body and speak about every unbecoming thing the person had done. The vain things he or she had said, the need to draw attention to themselves to puff up their self-worth, the failures to fulfill their obligations, their fears, their anxieties, you know, spend 10 minutes going through the litany of things that we've all been guilty of. Complete opposite of our modern tradition to, to uh, celebrate the good, often with hollow platitudes, even when there is very little good in the deceased person. I'm not exactly sure of the um, purpose of this ritual. Some of you in anthropology may know about it. But I think um, because it lasted a long time, sometimes through the night or several days, um, you can imagine. Uh, but I think it was an effort to unburden the soul, to lift the pall, so to speak, so that the soul could ascend. And I was thinking of a little thought experiment if um, such a ceremony were held for Dave Hurst, it might end up something like this. Everyone sitting around in silence. After about five minutes, someone would say, I can't think of anything. And the next person would say, I can't think of anything either. Let's get out of here. <laughs> you know? uh, and isn't that true? Can anyone think of anything that untoward that Dave Hurst did? And don't we have to admit that that's really exceptional? I mean, our closest friends, the people we've dealt with, we've had brouhaha's uh, with knockouts and different, watching them misbehave in all sorts of different ways, and sometimes reflecting our own behavior but I just can't I can't see Dave even getting angry now tell you must have seen it <laughs> but I I, uh, I don't know it's, to me it's a very unusual quality and um, it reminded me of this conversation I had with him very brief conversation before the science lecture series uh, Dave this was kind of one of his babies. He was running the science lecture series, which used to be a kind of unwritten uh, requirement for new STEM faculty, they were called STEM in those days, to, to give a talk at the science lecture series. And Dave was giving a talk, and I happened to bump into him uh, right before the talk. It's got to be 30 years ago in CM 225, this lecture hall. Prepared, and he said, "Oh yeah, I'm over prepared. But I'm a little nervous." So I, I said, "Yeah, I'm just too friendly. Oh, yeah, well, just be yourself." Yeah. And then um, after the talk, which was stellar, of course it was stellar. He was an astronomer. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, but it was as always. His, uh, and he gave many. Science lecture talks. They were very interesting and informative, perfectly, uh, perfectly created. Um, he calls and he says, "You know what you said is just what I needed," which is which was really a joke because because Dave was himself. He really was himself, and you know I'm not myself. You're not yourself. Jean Lecouillet is not himself. I was going to say Dr. Corner, but Jean's an easier title. <laughs> this is what the philosophers say. We're not ourselves in some profound way. But Dave was different. 
he was real. And because of that, when you were around him, you felt a little more real. And in his memory, he left us just to aspire to. So thank you. Now I, I'd like to bring up uh, Dave's other friend and colleague today, Jean Lapierre. As, as, as some of you may remember, I chaired the uh, Distinguished Faculty Award Committee for a number of years. And as I was looking at my notes to prepare for this little presentation, I couldn't help but reminisce about all the great teachers that we've had at the college. We had some that were uh, outstanding in the classroom who were very effective in motivating their students and, and uh, getting them to learn and wanting to better themselves. Others uh, developed new classes, even new programs uh, that enriched the college. Uh, others still um, develop new methods of teaching, especially with technology. And uh, others uh, reached out to the community and uh, developed precious links with the people that we serve. Dave Hurst was a star in each one of these. Very remarkable very remarkable BFA. He was uh, an outstanding teacher and uh, his students uh, raved about him and that's why uh, he got one of the first uh, Distinguished Faculty Awards. Um, even at that time he had already started uh, developing some classes in astronomy and that of course uh, developed into a full scale program and then with, uh, with his colleague Dave Davenport, uh, they explored the ideas of planetariums and eventually found these great new planetariums and managed to convince the college to get one. And we were the first ones west of the Mississippi to get a planetarium like this, which was quite an achievement. Um, Dave also reached out. Um, well, he was also one of the first ones um, to experiment with uh, technology in, uh, in his classes. And then he reached out to uh, the community, making a lot of presentations to various groups. And in particular, he made presentations to elementary schools. And sure enough, once we got the planetarium, he started inviting teachers from elementary schools to bring their kids here and save them a few mornings uh, where they could do that. And that was the beginning of a tremendously successful program, which used to bring us about 5,000 kids every year before the, uh, the uh, pandemic. And I'm sure we're going to recover that number because the teachers are still want to come. They want to bring their kids to the planetarium and then we develop other uh, activities downstairs. But it's very, very, very popular. Um, that was um, another one of uh, Dave's creations. Um, and then, of course, he took care of, of his responsibilities as a member of the college community and he uh, organized the, the uh, science lecture series for a few years. Uh, they was a star in just about every category that we ever considered for a distinguished faculty award. And so I'm very glad that we are uh, <coughs> rendering homage to him uh, today because it certainly is very well deserved.
And at this time, I'd, I'd like to ask if there's anyone else who'd like to share share their members of, of Dave with us. Yeah. Anyway, I'm Dan Edgar, and I work in the chemistry department. And uh, just wanted to start off saying that it uh, uh, took uh, two Daves to get this project up the ground. And the other Dave's Dave Davenport, who's here today. And uh, Dave Davenport had just an unparalleled uh, determination and will to get things done. And uh, deans and presidents would cower in their, <laughs> in their rooms if they knew Dave was coming, because they knew he was going to pursue his goals with great tenacity and uh, get things done. So uh, I don't think either Dave could have uh, pulled off this fantastic uh, planetarium alone, but together they managed to usher in uh, quite a, a wonderful uh, planetarium. But I just wanted to recount uh, something I heard at the memorial service uh, a few months ago, not Dave, that when he was a uh, young chemistry professor at Glendale College, he had befriended one of his students who was an outdoorsman like Dave, they planned a trip to the Grand Tetons, which is in Wyoming, Jackson Hole country, Jenny's Lake at the foot of the mountains, just tremendous place, very beautiful uh, surroundings. So anyway, they planned this camping and uh, climbing trip and they got up there and apparently Dave was kind of distracted. He didn't seem to really appreciate his surroundings and found out that that was because he found something even more fascinating at the campsite and that was Netta. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we could say Netta sort of fell into his orbit. <laughs> and, uh, Netta being uh, kind and uh, thoughtful, congenial, intelligent like Dave. It was only natural that I, the two would gravitate toward <laughs> one another. <laughs> And thus began a, a lifetime uh, partnership. And, uh, and I can't help but think about, uh, you know, this, we're here to talk about the legacy of this planetarium. And I, I think if we were to have a seance, you know, if we all join hands and <laughs> have seance and reached out to Dave in the great beyond and said, you know, what achievement are you most proud of? I think probably Coming in at number one would be his daughter Elizabeth, with the planetarium a close second. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I would just think that uh, thinking of Dave, uh, he gave us a, you know a, a model of a life well lived. That uh, he did what he enjoyed doing, and uh, had a long life, had a wonderful family. Uh, was you know active uh, throughout his whole life, so I would say you know three cheers for Dave, and uh, you know I think we could uh, only hope uh, to do as well. You know I think it's a, a model for life well lived. Uh, at this point, then, uh, we have a presentation. Yes. So, um, with the help of many individuals who have sent in some photographs, some videos, um, my colleague Barbara has put together a photo montage and video montage. So, I am going to take this opportunity to recline your chairs for you so that you are more comfortably seated to view the planetarium dome. And then I will turn it over to Barbara, who is at the back of the planetarium, kind of at the brains and the control center, to take it away to show you our, uh, the way that we are going to honor Dave.
professor first. Um, he has many interests, many talents, and uh, he's a great asset to the college. On Monday, you might poke your head into one of his classes and see that over in PB 101, he's got a class full of students sitting at computers, uh, changing the trajectories of planets. And uh, in fact, he got an award for bringing high technology into the classroom. So that's one type of thing that he does. Now on Tuesday, you might stick uh, your nose into another classroom and see that uh, he's juggling up in front of the class. And uh, he likes to uh, get the planets going. And then he talks about, OK, watch this, retrograde motion. And then he juggles them the other way. And he has a real good behind the back shot that you really shouldn't miss. Uh, on Wednesday, you might see him scurrying around campus uh, dressed as a Buddhist monk one day. Maybe another day, he'll be a Sikh warrior. And uh, he's probably on his way to his Humanities 101 class where he and Joe Van Dam uh, very often dress up for their uh, uh, discussion of Eastern and Western culture. So uh, that's another uh, face you may see him wear. On Thursday, if you poke your head into uh, chemistry lab over here, you'll see him wearing goggles and a white lab coat because he also teaches chemistry. And then if you've had enough of uh, Dave Hurst and Friday, you want to get away from it all, drive up into Angeles Crest and watch the sunset. You'll probably see him up there also with his class of astronomy students because he teaches observational astronomy up there in the mountains. So uh, he's a multifaceted person. He was faculty member of the year a year ago. That should be no surprise. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Dave Hurst. astronomy person and I'm going to talk to you a bit about astronomy and to get started we are all curious beasts and we all ask the same kind of questions at some point or another in our lives and one of those sets of important questions is simply where are we and what is the neighborhood like when Hubble did his stuff at Mount Wilson in the 1920s and 1930s, he became the world's authority on galaxies. And Hubble thought that if you considered space on a big enough scale, what you would probably find is that the galaxies are distributed evenly, homogeneously. That there, there, there are these places where we know there are clumps and clusters, but those are probably evenly distributed on the really big scale. And he was the authority, so this became the party line. The orthodox view in astronomy is that galaxies are distributed evenly throughout space. In the 60s, there were hints that this might not be true. And in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of people who became questioners and challenged this view. And one of the very imaginative challengers to that accepted view was a lady named Margaret Geller, who happens to be the head of the team that we're watching. Let me introduce the whole team here. You've seen some of them. Uh, Margaret Geller and the team is at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. So they're at Harvard. Margaret Geller was the theoretician whose idea it was originally to make this survey. She had this hunch that things weren't the way Hubble had thought they were. And she teamed up with John Hukra, who you've seen wearing the hat at the telescope. He's the telescope magician. You need somebody who knows how to make telescopes work. And Hukra is the guy. The, the two graduate students who are working with them are Anne and Ron. And you, you notice graduate students don't have last names. <laughs> Let alone undergraduate students. I don't know what your nickname is. They never mentioned them by name, but, but you did see the pressure on, on Anne there. She's saying, I've got to get the data here so I get my PhD. <laughs> if the skies are cloudy, I'm going to be in school another several months. And there, those of you who've been through graduate research understand the sort of pressure, but imagine having it dependent on the weather here.
what Hubble finds is that all remote galaxies are moving away from us. This is called redshift or redshift. And very interestingly, the way this motion is organized, the more remote the galaxy, the farther away it is, the faster it's moving. And if you think about it, the universe didn't have to be that way at all. I don't think Hubble expected to find this at all. I mean, he expected to find a much more random distribution. Galaxies coming toward us, galaxies going away, galaxies in this part of the sky going back and forth, in that part of the sky a different way. But it isn't. It's a highly organized, big-scale neighborhood that we are inhabiting. Like any good science, trying to answer a couple of very simple questions. Where are we? What's the neighborhood like? You end up getting hints, and you end up with a lot more questions. So let me reiterate some of the things that this sort of study leads to. Why is this sort of structure there? Is this the result of some conditions in the early universe shortly after the Big Bang? There must have been something going on there that has led to what we now see in the present state of the universe. And in all of this, what's the role of the mysterious dark matter? Some of you probably read about this. There's all this matter out there that we know is there because of its gravitational effects, but it's dark. And obviously what you're looking at here is the lit up matter. Uh, are those voids really empty? Is the dark matter distributed the same way these walls and bubbles of galaxies are? Is there dark matter in the voids? <laughs> Uh, all of this, you're going to have to stay tuned. There, there are bright people still working on this. But the, the key to even attempting to answer questions like that is you've got to have a good map. And what I've tried to show you today is the best mapping that we have showing us what our neighborhood is like on the grandest scale that we are currently aware of. Thank you.